If you will turn in your Bibles to the first chapter, the Gospel of Mark, beginning in verse 21, as we continue our study through the Word. Now, you'll remember last time that we began the Gospel of Mark, and Mark is one of the three synoptic writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those are the synoptic Gospels, and you'll remember that we talked about how Mark began his gospel there at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. And so he begins the gospel, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, the good news of the gospel message, he begins with Jesus' public ministry. And Jesus' public ministry started at his baptism there at the Jordan River. So, we saw Mark begin by giving us the ministry of John the Baptist. 400 years of silence, and then suddenly a fiery prophet arises on the scene, calling the nation to repentance and telling them that there is one coming after him who is mightier than he whose sandal he is not even worthy to unlatch. And you'll remember that People started to come from Jerusalem, Judea, and from all over to see this mighty prophet. And John recognized that he was the herald of the Messiah. But to John's dismay, one day he turns and there is Jesus, the Messiah, standing in front of him, waiting to be baptized in the Jordan River and You'll remember that, that John was taken aback. Am I to baptize you? You're the one that should be baptizing me. And Jesus tells him to suffer it, to be so, for now that all righteousness might be fulfilled. And Jesus was setting the example, is living the perfect life for us to follow into. We saw that after he came out of the baptism there in the River Jordan, that the Holy Spirit defeated descended in bodily form as a dove in the voice from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And Jesus' earthly ministry begins. We see that the very first thing that happens uh, after he comes out is that the Spirit leads him out into the wilderness. And for 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus is out in the desolate places. And we talked about how the desolate places speaks of the, the realm of the demonic and that Jesus marches straight into the realm of the demonic to announce that his kingdom is being set up and there's nothing you can do about it. And so 40 days later, Jesus uh, comes back and begins uh, his ministry. Mark fast forwards to Jesus being up in Galilee now and the calling of the first the disciples. Two sets of fishermen, two sets of brothers, Peter and Andrew, James and John. And you'll remember that they were fishing and he says to leave your nets Leave your identity in the world and I am going to give you a new identity. You are now going to become fishers of men. And so we saw the call on the disciples last time. And, and as we now continue, we're going to see Jesus in his ministry there in Capernaum and around the Sea of Galilee, we are going to see that Jesus is going to be giving an invitation to speak at the local synagogue. And we're going to see the events that unfolded. And afterwards, he's going to go for a Sabbath meal to Peter's house. And we're going to look at the events that took place there. And, uh, and then we are going to see that the chapter closes when a leper comes and presents himself before Jesus. So let's jump in to our text beginning Mark chapter 1 verse 21 and the scripture records then they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught and so we see that he comes into Capernaum Capernaum is a small fish, small fishing village there uh, on the sea of uh, Galilee and this is where Peter lived it's also where Jesus really kind of centers his Galilean ministry out of 
Capernaum, operating in and around and, and from Capernaum. And so the, it is the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath is from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. And so on Saturday morning, they would gather in the synagogue to come and to offer prayers and worship. They would read the Old Testament and the Law and Prophets, and, and then they would uh, invite a qualified person to come and to teach in the synagogue. And so Jesus was there. His fame was beginning to spread throughout. The people who had been coming to see John the Baptist and was being pointed towards Jesus, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and I must decrease that he may increase. And so he publicly acknowledged that Jesus is the one that he was referring to who would be mightier than himself. And, and so the eyes of the people were beginning to be drawn to Jesus. And so Jesus is there at the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum, and so they invite him to teach in the synagogue. And the people, they came in and they were excited. They couldn't wait to see what Jesus of Nazareth had to say to them. Nazareth was not that far away from where the Sea of Galilee uh, was. And so this itinerant teacher is now going to share. There was great speculation about him. And so no doubt they were interested in the things that he was going to say. And it says that in verse 22, and they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as having authority and not as the scribes. And so uh, immediately on the Sabbath, he enters the synagogue and taught. And it says that they were absolutely astonished at his teaching. He spoke with them and he revealed, imagine this, he revealed the heart of God to the people, God incarnate revealing the truth about himself, revealing the truth about his great love for people, about the darkness that they sit in, the separation that sin causes in a person's life, and, and, and that the kingdom of God was now at hand, and that they should turn away from the darkness and embrace the light and the truth of God's great love for his people. He spoke in such a way that the people were just absolutely astonished they had never heard anybody speak like this when the scribes would speak they would quote the other scribes they would quote the other rabbis as rabbi gamaliel says uh, you know or as rabbi hillel says and and they would always be quoting their sources jesus didn't quote anybody he just simply revealed truth to the people in such profound way, just wave after wave of pure, perfect truth pouring out of the source of all life, Jesus Christ to himself. And what was the response? The people were just undone. It says that they were astonished. That word means surprise and shock in awe as just truth came pouring out of the author of life. And so... Here we see that there was also now a man in the synagogue, verse 23, with an unclean spirit. And he cried out saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Can you imagine somebody standing up in a church service and pouring out this kind of diatribe. I mean, the whole congregation turned and looked. As perfect love was being poured out, as truth was hitting the people in wave after wave, the light of Jesus' teaching was too much for the evil of this demonized uh, life. And the demons had had enough. That was it. They couldn't take any more. And they screech uh, out uh, at the light that was bursting forth from the sun of of God. And so they, they object to these things that are being said, leave us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Now notice two things, the identification here of Jesus as both the son of man and son of God. He was fully man 
and he's fully God. And the demons even identify that. Jesus of Nazareth, that is Christ in his full humanity. His name was Jesus. He was from Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth. But they also turn around and say, we know who you are, the Holy One of God. And we see the deity of Christ here. And so the demons now pointing to the humanity and the deity of Jesus, the Messiah. And so we see this tremendous interruption there in the service and and no doubt all eyes are turned upon this demonized man with this outburst and no doubt they turned back over to see Jesus and what Jesus was going to do about this outburst. In verse 25 Mark records but Jesus rebuked him saying be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Jesus rebukes him and, and with the words, be quiet, come out of him. In the Greek, they're, they're, these words contain a forceful emphasis. And the word be quiet is literally translated be muzzled. And as this demon is you know, speaking out, and Jesus just simply tells him, commands him to be muzzled, not another word. And we see that what happens next is, is that the, the demon's not allowed to talk, so it starts to just shriek and convulse. And then with a loud, ah, it comes out. And then there's just the man there. And everyone's like, whoa, what just happened? Do you think that that would be a memorable church service, you know, <laughs> if something like that happened in the, in the middle of the service? Uh, and so verse 27, it says that they were all amazed uh, so that they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority, he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him and immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around in Galilee Jesus spoke like no one else and Jesus acted like no one else with power and with authority to where he commands even the demonic realm and they are forced into absolute submission and so the people just were in awe and wonder and and immediately afterwards they went telling everybody what had happened uh, in that service what they had just experienced and what they had just seen it was customary after service that you would go home and you would enjoy the Sabbath meal. Now remember that there was no working on the Sabbath, so all of the, the meal and the preparations had to have been done ahead of time, but this was customary now to go and to sit and to enjoy that. Jesus had been invited to go to Peter's house. Now, can you imagine having the honor uh, of having Jesus come to your house uh, for the Sabbath meal. Now, in Capernaum today, there is the, uh, the remains of the very synagogue that most scholars believe is the very synagogue where these events took place. There's a church that's been built uh, over the top of the ruins, and when you go there and visit, you can go about 75 yards away to the very house that they believe was Peter's actual house where Jesus and uh, the disciples now departed from the synagogue and move over to Peter's house. Now, the disciples had just been called, and so these were the first impressions that were being placed upon the disciples' minds as they had been called to leave their nets and come, and I will make you fishers of men. We're going to see Jesus as he not only is presenting himself as the Messiah to the nation, not only is he establishing the kingdom of God, here upon this earth, but we're also going to be watching in his ministry as he is building up the apostles, as he is growing them into these mighty men of God upon whose shoulders now the early church uh, is going to be first 
formed. And so the apostles now, Peter and Andrew, James and John, they are all going from the synagogue with Jesus to Peter's house to celebrate this meal. But when they get there, it's interesting. Verse 29, it says, Now as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. As soon as they come in to now host the meal for Jesus, there is a problem. And Peter's mother-in-law is sick and is in bed with a fever. She is not able to extend the customary hospitality in the house that had been planned. And so when Jesus comes over, they're like, oh, we've got a little bit of a problem. Mom's sick in bed here. And, uh, and so Jesus is immediately made aware of it. And Mark records that he goes over to Peter's mother-in-law. Look at what it says. And so uh, he came and he took her by the hand, verse 31, and lifted her up and immediately the fever, fever left her and she served uh, them. In Luke's gospel, it tells us that, that he comes uh, over to her and he rebukes the fever. Matthew says he touched her and Mark and tells us that he took her by the hand and stood her up. And so we see this composite picture of Jesus going over to Peter's mother-in-law and standing over her and taking her by the hand and rebukes the fever and tells it to depart. And immediately that fever had to obey the Lord's command and it departed from her body with the same authority that he had just commanded the demons to come out of the man in the synagogue. And she was restored into the fullness of health. And Jesus helps her to stand up out of the bed and now fully recovered her health. What does she do? She serves uh, them. And so here we see a picture of Jesus now with the church. You see, Jesus comes and, and we are caught up and bound up in our infirmities. And what does our infirmities do? They prevent us from loving others. They prevent us from blessing others. They prevent us from serving others. And so when we're bound up in iniquity, when we've got anger issues and unforgiveness and all of the different challenges that are in us, what does this do? This prevents us from doing what God created us to do. And that is to let his love flow through us. Her physical illness was keeping her from letting the love of God flow through her and to be that hostess uh, in her home. So Jesus heals her of her infirmity. And what does that allow her to do? It allows her to now do what she was created to do. And that's to let God's love flow through her onto others. And that's a picture for you and for I. Today, 2,000 years later, Jesus is still willing to take our hand and to help us to stand back up again. Is there any illness in your life, any bondage, any darkness that is holding you back from allowing God's love to flow freely into your heart and onto those that are around you. And, and if so, then allow the Lord to take your hand and to stand you back up again so that you can continue to move forward. So our lives are rich and full and blessed when God's love is flowing out of us. And anything that keeps that love from flowing into our hearts and out onto those around us know this that jesus can remove that jesus can heal that jesus can fix that jesus can bring that back to life again inside of you he is the author and the finisher of our faith he is the light of the world he is the alpha and the omega and at his command Everything obeys. And so the Lord is here with us as much as he was 2,000 years ago. A guest in Peter's house. He is a guest in his house uh, here today. And so we see that, uh, that this then prompted this 
fellowship in this meal, this Sabbath meal. No doubt this was a Sabbath meal that the apostles would never forget uh, uh, either from the amazing events that had gone on in the synagogue to the very calling of them and the leaving of their nets to now the fever being dismissed by the Lord and having to depart. But, but also notice this, that all of the people that were in synagogue that day that were also celebrating their Sabbath meal, they were all waiting for one thing. And that was for the sun to go down. Because the minute that the sun went down, the Sabbath was over. And what did that mean? You were free to move about the cabin now. You were uh, allowed to go and to participate in, uh, in daily life. And, and what they all wanted to do was that they all wanted to go and to grab anybody that they knew that was infirm, that was sick, or that was demon-possessed, and to immediately bring them to Jesus, uh, who was there in Peter's house. So, uh, so the minute that Shabbat was over, the minute that the third star was visible, that marks the official ending of uh, the Sabbath. Uh, the people were out uh, and about. Look in verse 32. It says, And at evening... When the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. So ready, set, go. Sabbath is over and everybody now swarms and grabs uh, everybody that needs a touch from Jesus. And they all race over to Peter's house. And, and that had to be quite a waiting room outside in Peter's uh, house there of all the demon-possessed people mixed with all the, the sick people and the crowd uh, that was gathered there. But they were all there for one reason. Jesus had the authority and the power to help them and to heal them. And they believed that and they grabbed every person, every loved one that they knew. And they brought them to Jesus and the whole city. Can you imagine what that had to have been like that night? The whole city is gathered around Peter's house. In verse 34, Mark tells us, then he healed Many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. And so all of these lives, imagine the testimonies that were being built that night as you had a sick relative or a sick daughter or son or wife and you brought them to Jesus and Jesus touched them and healed them. And the families of those people who were healed. He healed the diseases as well. And, and people were bringing the, uh, those of their loved ones that had diseases and he was healing them. And the crazies, the people who had demonic possession, who had surrendered their lives to oppression, now suddenly Jesus was handing their life back to them. And suddenly now they went home freed from the bondage that had ravaged their homes and their relationships and their families. And suddenly now all of the lives of the families and extended families and friends were being impacted and touched by the amazing healing that was happening with Jesus' direction. And so... What a night that had to have been. Jesus commanded that the demons remained silent. And so all of this healing takes place. And, and no doubt when the apostles were laying on their bed that night going to sleep, it was like, wow, what a day that was. They had never seen anything like it. And Imagine they had just been called into ministry. This was just the beginning. This was introduction, orientation, 101 to the things that were going to happen as they now had been invited to participate with Jesus in the setting up of his kingdom. Morning broke early, no doubt, the next day. And the disciples, they jump up and they go to wake Jesus up. But uh, he's not there. He's gone. 
and everybody is looking for him, and nobody can find uh, Jesus. And the scriptures let us know what happened. Verse 35, now in the morning, having risen a long while before what? Oh, before daylight, uh, now the Lord wakes up, it says, and he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. The ministry was launched. And man, his fame and his popularity was beginning to spread like wildfire. As he started to impact these people's lives, as, as lives were being changed, they were telling others and the others were telling others and, and like ripples that go out from a rock thrown into a, a pond. So also were the stories and the testimonies of Jesus and going forth. But, but Jesus didn't want to be known as a miracle worker. He didn't want the fame. He didn't want the people to come like a carnival show and let's all watch him do mighty acts. He came to set people free from their bondage. He came to pierce the darkness of sin and the demonic oppression with the light and the glory of the love of the kingdom of God. And so as the, as the fame and the crowds began, Jesus departs and, and he spends time just alone with the Father. Father, what next? How do you want this to all unfold? Not my will, but your will be done. Show me, as things are starting to get crazy, show me what your will is and, and what you would have uh, for me. The, the morning wakes up and, man, the people in C Capernaum, they are fired up. Last night was just a, a foretaste. That was the appetizer. Today, main course, main show. Where is Jesus? They're probably planning a parade for him and, uh, and everything else that is going to go with the promotion now of this amazing miracle worker. And, and the disciples, uh, verse 36, it says, and, and Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And when they found him, they said to him, everyone is looking for you. I don't know if you know this. We're all, this was, you made a big hit yesterday, Jesus. <laughs> We've got major synagogues calling. They're trying to book you. We've got a television interview that they want to do with you. We see big things happening uh, here. We've got a whole itinerary lined out for you today. And, and come on, let's go. <laughs> but Jesus isn't subject to the plans of man. He submitted to the will of the Father. And so he answers them. But he said to them, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also because for this purpose I have come forth. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. He says that for this purpose I have come forth. He came to proclaim the good news of God. And to call the people to repentance and to receive and to believe in the kingdom that was being set up. The Capernaum crowds were seeking him now as a miracle worker. But he, his desire was to bring light to those who were still sitting in darkness. And to bring the truth of the gospel that men can be set free from the bondage of sin in their life. And so Jesus now continues to move about and to preach in the various different villages and towns uh, around uh, Galilee. And as he is out and about, a leper comes to Jesus. Verse 40, it says, Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. If ever there is a picture of desperation in the Bible, this is one of them. <clears throat> Leprosy was, was a word that struck fear into the heart of every single person that lived in that day. There was no cure for leprosy. There still is not. It was terminal. It would begin with a, a patch of dry skin or a 
rash and the, the law commanded you that when you had a patch of scaly or itchy or a rash that was resistant to going away, you were to show it to the priest. So one day this man had a patch of dry skin and immediately you have to control your fear because the first thing that you are afraid of is that what if this is leprosy? But you convince yourself that it's really like any other patch of dry skin you've had in your life and, and you go about, but as time begins to unfold, you become aware that this isn't quite looking like anything else that you've ever had before. And you know that you're commanded by the law to go and to show it to the priests. But no doubt there are always the reasons to defer the going to the priest and until there comes the conviction that you have to show this to the priest. And so the man went and showed it to the priest and immediately, according to the law, you were put underneath observation. In seven days you would return and show it again to the priest. And in seven days he goes back. Did he tell his family that he had even gone and shown it to the priest? Or did he not even want to worry them at all in case it came back with good news? But... No doubt with compression in his heart did that week and go by and, and he goes to the priest hoping for a good report that it's just a normal rash and, and you are good to go and no doubt you go and you offer thanksgiving to God and the sacrifice praising him that you have been spared and that was certainly what this man was hoping. But it wasn't the answer that he received. And the priest examined him and looked at him and told him, I'm sorry. You have leprosy. And suddenly his whole life changed. He had to go home and say goodbye to his wife. Honey, that's all the time that we got together. We don't get to build our marriage any, anymore. To the kids, no longer would he be there to disciple them up and encourage them to hold them or play with them. He was relegated into the deserted places he was to depart because of his contamination now upon the others around him. And he had to leave his work and his friends and his neighbors and his life and everybody that he loved. And he had to go into the wilderness to wait to die. Because leprosy just simply ate you alive, uh, attacking the nervous system first, deadening your nerves to where you couldn't feel anything, and then slowly attacking the internal organs until you died a slow and painful death. There were communities of lepers that would support each other. And, uh, and so with those words... Uh, ringing in his ear, he had to depart from his life. Luke, the physician recording this event, lets us know from a physician's standpoint, it says that he was a leper filled with leprosy, meaning that it was at the later stages that he was a man that wasn't just recently uh, and new to his leprous condition. He was completely filled now. The leprosy was running its terrible course. And this man comes and he falls down. If you're willing... I believe that you can. You can make me whole. You can 
cleanse me. There has never been anybody that's been healed from leprosy. From the time of Moses, no Jew, all the way to the time of this leper bowing down before Jesus. Miriam, she was healed from leprosy, but she was struck by God with leprosy as a judgment against her, and then he, he healed her. And there was one case of a person being healed by God of leprosy, but it wasn't a Jew. It was Naaman the Syrian who dips himself seven times uh, in the Jordan River and is healed under the direction of Elisha the prophet, but never a Jew. But this man believes that Jesus can heal him. And he throws himself imploring, begging, and kneeling down before him. You can make me clean. In verse 41, it says, Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I am willing. Be cleansed. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. As with the fever, so with the leprosy, it was gone instantly. And we see that, that it wasn't that a healing process began with his word, but that it was a complete instantaneous restoration to fullness of health. And this man suddenly, touched by the power of God, is made whole. And in verse 43 it says, And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Now, Here's something that is absolutely mind-blowing. God placed in the law through Moses the commandment now of when leprosy is healed, how to restore a person back into community again. And these were the sacrifices that you were to offer. It's contained in Exodus chapter 13. There had never been an instance where the priests had ever used this because it had never, ever happened in the entire history of the nation. But God had placed that in the scriptures just for this time when he would send his son to heal the leper, to send him back to the priests now to have him restored back into community and back into fellowship again. And so he says, send it to them as a testimony to them. Now, I want you to know that the rabbis had divided up miracles. They had taken miracles and they divided them into two categories. There was the first category, which was uh, the, what was known as a normal miracle. Do you love that? A normal miracle. Okay. Now, a normal miracle, this was the category that anybody could perform if they were empowered by God and by God's Spirit, they could do a first classification, a normal miracle. But there was a second classification, and this was called the Messianic miracles. This was a category that they believed that only the Messiah would be able to perform these miracles. Uh, and the healing of a leper was one of the messianic miracles uh, uh, that the rabbis had. And now the Sanhedrin had a whole procedure that they were to follow. If a messianic miracle showed up in the country, they were then to follow these things, these prescriptions now, if and when that happens. And so Jesus tells this leper, to now go and present yourself in Jerusalem and offer the required sacrifices, he says, as a testimony to them. He is announcing to the nation, to the leaders, that a messianic miracle 
has just been performed. And we're going to watch what happens when suddenly this leper shows up in Jerusalem and lets them know that a messianic miracle has taken place. And so let's see what the response uh, is by this man who is told, don't say anything to anyone Just go show yourself to the priests in Jerusalem. Verse 45, however, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted (laughs) places. And they came to him from where? from every direction. So uh, I want you to know that, that here he tells this man not to give his testimony to anybody and he goes giving his testimony to everybody. He tells us to go give our testimony to everybody and we don't give it to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but what is interesting here is that it says uh, uh, that they came from everywhere. And I want you to know they came from every direction. I want you to know that people are still coming to Jesus from every single direction, from every nation, from every tribe, from every tongue. People are coming and bringing their brokenness, their darkness, and their sin to Jesus. And Jesus is continuing to light up this world. As we close our study here, I just want to draw our attention for a minute to verse 41 where it says that Jesus was moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion. When he saw this leper and he saw the pain of this man's life, when he saw the leprosy in full bloom, I want you to know that leprosy is a typology of sin. This man represented, uh, an, in typology, a man whose sins has ravaged uh, his life. And sin leads us to death and ultimate and to destruction. This is the, the ravages of sin in a person's uh, life. And so he has compassion upon him. And I want you to know something, that Jesus has compassion on you. I want you to know that. I want you to receive that today. God's great love for you. So oftentimes we think that God is mad at us, that he's looking upon us at our failures and shaking his fists and and waiting to punish us for every single time that we missed step and and he sees everything and that he's in, in heaven looking down upon us with this scowl on his face of disapproval over you. And I want you to know something that's a lie from the pit of hell god loves you he has compassion upon you he sees your weakness he knows our brokenness he walked uh, amongst us we don't have a high priest that doesn't understand us in every single way shape and form in matthew's gospel it says that jesus looked upon the multitudes and he was moved uh, with compassion. It says, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. If you want a picture uh, uh, of helpless and desperate, it is a sheep that don't have a shepherd. They will be ravaged. They will be scrawny. They will be devoured by the elements. They have no survival instincts whatsoever. And they have no way to defend themselves. They are defenseless. <laughs> Apart from the care of a shepherd, they are in grave trouble. And he looks upon us and he looked upon the people and they were scattered and they were weary. They were sheep without a shepherd. And he is the good shepherd. And he longs to sweep them up underneath his arms and to minister to them, to lead them into green pastures and and beside the still waters, to anoint our heads with oil and to prepare a, a banquet that we can sit down in the midst of our enemies. That is his desire for you, to be able to take and to make you whole and to bless you You were made to receive God's love and to pour his love out onto everybody that is around you. And anything in your life that's keeping you from being connected to God 
and that's keeping you from pouring his love out. He wants to repair that. He wants to heal that. He wants to minister to that. His gentleness and his compassion, it says of the Lord, that a bruised reed, (laughs) he won't break it. And a smoking wick, he won't extinguish it. He loves you. He is for you. He wants to take and to to strengthen you and to nurture you and to build you up into a mighty man, into a mighty woman of God that that is God's intention for you. That's his purpose when he created that you would have this vibrant, full, abundant life where love is flowing in and flowing out. I want you to know clearly and to hear it. Jesus has compassion on you. He loves you. He cares for you. He will never reject you. He will never condemn you. You need only come to your shepherd and to bring him every infirmity, every illness, every brokenness, every bit of darkness that you have and give it over to the shepherd and let the shepherd sweep you up into his arms and let him speak to you this day. I am willing. Be made whole. But notice that the leper came to him in his need, in his desperation, identifying his own brokenness of what he needed from the Lord. The Bible says that you have not because you, because you ask not. I had somebody after service come up to me and say, why don't we go to the Lord? Why don't we bring our brokenness and and the things that we need? He says, why don't we bring them to the Lord? And I gave him the the most profound answer I could think of. I don't know. (laughs) I said, but when the Lord shows you, tell me so I can tell everybody else (laughs) as well. You have a loving, caring shepherd that laid down his life to rescue you, to help you, to heal you, and to bless you. Don't be afraid of your shepherd. Come to him. Implore him. Kneel down before him this day before you depart and ask him to make you whole. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you. You are a mighty God. And Jesus, you are a mighty Savior. Thank you for your willingness to come and depart from your glory in heaven, to walk the roads of this earth, to lay your life down, to rescue each and every one of us. And Father, in Christ is the fullness of life. Would you help us, Lord, this day to come and to kneel before you, Lord, and and to ask for whatever it is that we need in our life and and may we like the leper like <laughs> Peter's mother-in-law may may we receive that hand that outstretched hand that stands us back up again if we have fallen or backslidden if we're playing with darkness or if we've been trapped by darkness and sin in our life lord would you come this day? Would we confess that and, and ask you to break us out of the bondage of addiction or darkness or sin and stand us back up on our feet again that we might receive the fullness of your love and that we might pour out your love on those around us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.